From McCain Auditorium on the campus of Kansas State University in Manhattan, the K-State Radio Network presents now an address by Senator Charles Percy, Republican of Illinois, speaking in the series of Landon Lectures on Public Issues. Senator Percy is the ranking Republican on the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. He'll be discussing the United States and its responsibility as regards feeding the world. Senator Percy's address is part of a conference, a two-day affair, taking place today and tomorrow here on the K-State campus, dealing with the political aspects of world food problems, a conference believed to be the first of its kind, established here by the Department of Political Science at Kansas State University and by the Kansas Agricultural Experiment Station. Senator Percy, as we say, part of that conference. The senator now arriving on the stage, along with the other dignitaries, including Governor Alf Landon, for whom this series of lectures is named, and Kansas State University President Dr. Dwayne Auker. And welcome to the 36th lecture in the Landon Lecture Series at Kansas State University. My name is Dwayne Auker, and I would like first to introduce the platform guests, in addition to the speaker. On your right, Mr. Terry Matlack, our new Kansas State University student body president. Terry? On my immediate right, Kansas State's favorite wildcat, Governor Alf Landon. And Dr. Barry Flinchbaugh, who is responsible for the Landon Lecture Series organization. It's our pleasure this morning to have with us Illinois Senator Charles Percy to speak in this distinguished lecture series and to deliver the keynote address for our two-day conference on the political aspects of world food problems. This morning, Senator Percy will direct his remarks to answering the question, does the United States have the responsibility to feed the world? Senator Percy is unusually qualified to speak on this subject as he has provided important legislative leadership in many areas of international and domestic affairs related to the encompass encompassing problems of world food and world health needs. He is currently the ranking Republican on the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. He is also a member of the Joint Economic Committee, the Special Committee on Aging, and the Foreign Relations Committee, where he is the ranking Republican on both its subcommittees on multinational corporations and Near East and South Asian affairs. The Senator's major domestic legislative interests and initiatives have been in the field of the elderly, consumer protection, and the economy. Senator Percy is an advocate of international action on food and population problems, of greater emphasis on multilateral development assistance, and of increased coordination of foreign and military policies. In 1974, he served as a member of the U.S. delegation to the 29th United a nation's General Assembly where he specialized in economic and humanitarian issues. It is with these special experiences and qualifications that Senator Percy addresses the issue here today, the U.S. responsibility to world war toward world food problems. Senator Percy. I'm honored indeed to be at these sunrise services without the sun this morning, but uh, mm -hmm. a little more warmth than we've had in the winter this year. The warmth of the campus, the warmth of the hospitality that I have had from Chairman Barry, from uh, my compatriot in republicanism and politics, uh, and the beloved Governor Landon, and from the uh, delightful visit I've had a chance to have with uh, President Ocker in his office talking about the future of this great institution is very heartwarming indeed. I do want to say, uh, President Terry, uh, I tried to have people call me president, and I worked hard at it, but I never made it. You've made it. And Mr. Chairman uh, Barry, I want to recall the memory, the fine testimony you gave before our select committee on nutrition and human needs in the United States Senate. The position you took on world food reserves, which really 
is the Percy position the day after I heard your testimony, because I was absolutely convinced that you were right, that we ought to have international control. We ought not to use it for stabilization of prices, but we ought to use it only for countries and people that can, can't afford to buy. So we use it for famine conditions, clearly, and not build up these huge surpluses that would depress prices and artificially uh, distort markets. So uh, as an academician, let me say you're a sound, solid citizen, and I like your economics, and we, we invite you back any time that you can come. I'd like to say just a personal note about Governor Landon. It's terribly hard for me to realize that I was in my teens when he ran for president of the United States 41 years ago. It's hard for me to realize that that phenomena creates this phenomena of a man who never looks back that I've ever known him. He's always looking ahead. He's talking about the year 2000 and where we're going as a nation. And certainly the looking at world food problems is a visionary problem of the future that we're going to be mulling over and discussing today, but it's just typical of the kind of foresight he's had. Now, we are both Republicans, but there's a difference between us. I took my degree in economics, and when I came back from the Navy, I went to night law school. But uh, something happened at Bell and Howell, and I had to drop out. So I'm a law school dropout, and he is a cum laude graduate of a law school. I ran for governor in 1964. People tell me that wasn't a very good year to run for Republicans, but I wasn't a very good candidate either. I lost the governorship, and, and Governor Landon won it. Even my son-in-law became governor of West Virginia 30 days ago or 60 days ago. He made it, but I never did. I tried to become a candidate for president. I never even got on the ticket. At least you made the, the ticket. You didn't rate the presidency, but you were the nominee of the great Republican Party. But is Mrs. Landon here, by the way, this morning? I wonder if she could stand up so we could see her. Mrs. Landon, good morning. So nice to see you. The one thing I can say that we have in common that really I equal what Governor Landon did is have vision and look ahead and marry a girl nine years exactly, my wife and Mrs. Landon, nine years younger, so that we have someone to take care of us <laughs> in our, when we finally, and he hadn't begun it, nor have I when we finally get into our advanced later age in life. So it's with that kind of vision that we share in common, I hope also many other ideas. Maybe some of the ideas I have in this field will not, will not coincide exactly with the governor's, but we'll talk it out and argue it out later because there can be diversity and division of thought even among Republicans and among people of goodwill. And some of the problems that we're gonna be talking about are areas of concern that uh, we do have differences on. Uh, Senator Dole and I came out with a report uh, saying that we should have a more balanced diet. Uh, we shouldn't have as much consumption of certain types of red meat. We should balance it out with other kinds uh, and a lot of other things. But that one sentence in that report of the whole report is what caused cattlemen in Illinois and Kansas to jump all over us. So things are controversial uh, if they're worthwhile. And the easy problems we all have a consensus on and we have resolved. It's the ones where there is controversy and difference of opinion that we should be dealing with, and that's why your presence this morning uh, means so much to me. We're going to talk about world, the world food crisis, uh, but it couldn't... It didn't seem to me as though we in this country had much of a crisis. When I flew over from Kansas City this morning, the uh, beautiful farmland down below me, no different than flying over as I do uh, our own farms in Illinois, uh, two of which have been in my wife's family for 125 years, and 
are yielding awfully good uh, crops, grain and, and beans and corn uh, last year and will again this year, we trust. It's a beautiful sight, uh, particularly when you've got uh, right down below us uh, uh, acreage that uh, would produce 35 to 40 bushels of, of wheat and 135 of corn uh, up to those levels uh, a year. But we have to take into account one factor. This is the most bountiful country in the world so far as food production is concerned. And if you take into account the 147 members of the United Nations, nations, there are only seven of them that export food at all, net. A hundred and forty of them have to import food in order to live. The population growth is so immense that it, it almost forces us to run fast to stand still because today, before the, the sun goes down, if it comes up today, but before it does go down, and we know it's going to go down, even though there are clouds obscuring it today, another city of 200,000 people are going to be born in, a, in the world. And every day, that's compounding. In India alone, every year, year after year, another 12 million net added population. And China and other countries and Latin America are, of course, growing the fastest of all. So... The increased demand upon agriculture and upon farmers is immense. Mankind has existed for a long time, ever since Eve plucked the apple off the tree and took a bite out of it. And mankind, for almost all its in human history, looking at it relatively speaking, has spent most of its time just trying to get enough to feed itself. Even in this country, when we, when we were a, a new nation, an early nation, and, or colonies, it took better than 90% of us engaged in agriculture to produce enough food to feed us, but we were a big importer of food from, obviously, remember we did import tea, and we imported a great deal of product from Europe, particularly at Great Britain because we just couldn't produce enough in this country. So that it's a recent phenomena that causes this country and only six others on earth to be able to reduce the number of people in agriculture and have them producing a lot of other things as well. We're down now to where less than 5% of our population produces enough for not only ourselves but to ship $22 billion worth of agricultural products abroad to help feed the rest of the world. In 1776, a farmer in this country produced enough food to feed just himself and two other people. Today, a farmer produces enough to feed 56 other Americans and 30 other people around the world. 86 people every single farmer feeds, and that's only since the foundation of this country in 1976. And I think when we consider that food importing is increasing in so many other countries of the world, as we increase our production and can increase our exports, I think we then begin to recognize and realize how important American agriculture is, not only to us, but to the rest of the world. We could say, the world should say, thank heavens, America, with its productive capacity, its technology, its know-how, its ability to get a job done, whether it's out in space or here on Earth. Thank heavens, we have been blessed with the largest contingent land mass for fertile soil the world has ever seen. We have the best growing climate of any nation on Earth. We have more adequate rainfall balanced in year in and year out than any other nation on earth balanced for agriculture and food production. Now that doesn't take into account the phenomena of, say, western Kansas now or the dust bowls being created. The phenomena come and go, and some years are good and some are bad years. But on balance, we are so blessed by nature 
in this country that we're not only able to feed our own population, but we export 60% of our wheat and rice, 50% of our soybeans, 25% of our grain sorghum, and 20% of our corn. So the world is really increasingly becoming dependent upon American agriculture and the United States food exports. And I think U.S. agriculture and whatever policy we adopt as a food policy in this country is fully recognized that this has a tremendous effect upon the availability of food all over the world, on the quality of food all over the world, and on the price of food all over the world. So we now face tough questions. And one of the tougher questions thrown constantly in my mail and testimony before us are those who take the hard line that after all, this is a rough world we live in. There are a lot of things we want out of other countries. And as long as the OPEC countries can use oil as a weapon and embargo us, as they did in 1973, and literally cripple our economy and long gas line, we can hardly remember those days, but they were there, and they could come back. Why don't we, with all this dependence of the world on our food, why don't we use food as a weapon? Well, to the emotions, that's appealing. But to the reason and rationality of man, I say a resounding no. There's no morality to it, and it makes no sense whatsoever. You might just well embargo machine tools. You might just well embargo cameras. You might just well embargo a lot of other things. Why pick on food? Because what that does is create uncertainty. The reason we get big markets abroad is that we are a reliable supplier. We don't have the feast and famine, generally speaking that the rest of the world has because of what nature has given us. The most fertile land in the world and the best growing conditions in the world. We are a dependable supplier. That's why they buy so steadily from us and so consistently because they can count on us. But if we become an undependable supplier, if we threaten to embargo to get someone to do something, whether it's Jewish immigration, or which is a moral issue that's important to us, but we've got to choose the weapons we use. And we've got to be extraordinarily careful to not create such uncertainty in the minds of producers that they decide it's not worth being a farmer if the government can turn on and off that spigot. And the countries like Japan, from which I've just come, so dependent on soybeans for their soy products from Illinois and from every other state in this great Midwest. If we become an undependable supplier, they're going to buy up as they threatened to and started to do after the last embargo threat from a president of the United States, buy up lands in, in, in uh, Australia and farm those lands and open up new lands and lessen the demand for American agricultural products. So I say... No, let's not. You might just as well embargo the rest of the world on jet airliners, because we virtually supply 90% of all the jets supplied. Wide body, big body, narrow body, everything else. We've got a virtual world monopoly on the production of passenger jet airliners. Why not threaten them with that? That would cause less disruption. Though if I were a producer, I wouldn't keep producing. If suddenly, by national policy, you're going to cut off my sales. I'm not going to have the confidence I can put on stream all these planes that I'm taking orders for around the world if suddenly government can stick its hand, its cotton-picking hands on my business and cut off my customers. So let's forget all this emotion of the hardliners that say use food as a weapon. It's not only immoral, because food means nutrition for people that depend upon American food. And you can't tell them to wait three months while we work out something, you can't tell infants and mothers and older people to wait three or four months for their food and then we'll ship it to you because many of them are on the point of starvation right now and they won't survive those three or four months 
In fact, it's astounding when we consider that civilization ever since the birth of mankind has been the one thing that man has had in common is the fight to prevent starvation and to keep going from tribals to individuals out seeking and hunting food, spending 100% of their time doing it, till now we're a few percentage in this country, but in other countries most of them are doing it still. When we consider in the 20th century, in this century, 12 million people have died of starvation in the world, died of starvation, and actually in this country, some of them. So we have a long ways to go before we have solved this particular problem, and I don't believe in using food as a weapon. I say produce as much as we can from fence post to fence post. We need the balance of payments. We need the income. It pays for the raw materials. That $22 billion is paying for the gasoline that drove me in from the airport. We wouldn't have the money to buy that fuel from abroad. Ten million barrels a day that we have to buy from abroad if we didn't have agricultural products being shipped abroad with which we could get the balance of payments to save it. The other thing we should do in addition to supplying the world, and we want to be the world's biggest supplier of food products, and we're proud to be. This is the greatest demonstration I know of the free enterprise system over communism. When you cannot in the Soviet Union, with all their capacity to go out in space and produce these sophisticated weapons and huge hydrogen bombs and so forth, they still can't produce enough food to feed themselves. And they just don't know how to get production up. That's a tremendous testimony to the world that this system works and that system doesn't. Because this system is based on what we know about man and human nature. And that system doesn't. Theology is the highest order that any man can have to relate God and our maker to us and to have us better understand our relationship. But government and politics that I hope all many of you will participate in, government and politics is the relationship and defining it between men and women. What should our relationships be? And what we're trying to do is define our relationship to the world. And being known as the greatest food supplier of the world with only 5% of our population engaged in agriculture is testimony that this enterprise system that puts a floor under the pit of human disaster but has an unlimited ceiling over individual achievement and accomplishment really works is against that leveling of society creating the so-called common man. This is a society of uncommon men, and we don't want to go back and go into the controlled production phases of agriculture that took us through, I think, a black decade, uh, four decades, from the 30s up until we started to get to the free market again in the 1973 agricultural adage, that bill. Finally, I would like to say on that one point that the old adage, give a man a, a fish and he eats for a day, teach a man how to fish and he can eat for a lifetime is another obligation we have, to take our technology and know-how and experience and relate it to other people. We must meet demand, we must increase our output, but we must teach other people how to increase their output as well. For instance, in the last decade, even though 10 years ago our technology was quite high in agriculture, we increased our average yields on corn by 12 bushels per acre, from 74.1 to 86.2 in just the last 10 years. After all we've learned in the preceding years, in that decade alone, we increased our yields that much. And when we consider that in western Kansas with irrigation, we can produce up to 200 bushels of corn per acre in the, in, with those controlled conditions, we recognize there's perhaps no limitation on how high we can go in increasing our production. We have to take into account, though, we've got to look forward with vision to preserving land. You can't do as Chicago's been doing pave over everything and have then land left. We're taking a million acres of land a year out of agriculture in America. Can we afford to do that really? Just because a site is more profitable as an industrial site than agriculture, can we continue to take that many acres out of agriculture and do the job that this nation has to do? 
Can we continue to look on water as an unlimited resource? You can't do it when you look at the world as it is. The rivers, for instance, that, that bring the water just simply aren't where they're needed. That's, that's a, a fact of life we've got to live with. One third of the Earth's rivers are in South America, and they have only one eighth of the total land in the whole world. Now, you have to take into account that water is a resource we've got to look at. My son, who's a senior at Stanford, called me the other day and said, Dad, things are so bad on water out here that a group of us have gotten together, and they're going around door to door, knocking on the door and saying, do you know the biggest user and waster of water that you've got in your house is your toilet bowl? Ten gallons of water to flush down a little sterile urine. It won't hurt anyone. Ten gallons in those tanks. Here are three or four bricks. Put it in there. Let us go in and bend down the bulb, and we can cut your water consumption in half without in any way endangering the health of anyone in this household. You'll just be conserving something that is going to mean food to someone else because we're wasting so much of it and flushing it away. That's the kind of thinking that we actually have to do now about agricultural land, about water, and also about the last thing I'd like to mention, energy. In Japan, a couple of months ago, good friends of mine said, in a sense, if we could say this to you as a friend, off the record, Americans are looked upon as energy pigs. They waste, they squander a depleting resource. You have a huge reserve in the United States, but it's running out. We don't have any in Japan. We have to import 100% of our energy. And it really hurts the image of America, known as the most efficiently organized nation on Earth, to be such wasters and squanders of energy. The average automobile parked right outside, the average car uses 10% of its energy to propel the vehicle. The rest, 90%, are used extraneously and not really needed to get the person from the two points that they may be going. Fossil fuel uh, is increasing very rapidly, and fossil fuel is the principal raw material used in agriculture. 60 to 80 percent increase of agricultural production is a result of the increases in fertilizer and the use of fertilizer, many of which are based on, on and, and made from fossil fuel. If you just take a look at a quart uh, of oil, it's taken a half a million years maybe to create that. And that quart of oil will just keep five 100-watt bulbs going for one hour. And then it's gone forever. You leave the lights on in a motel or hotel room or have excess lights in any room, no matter where it is. You're just wasting and squandering something that's taken a half a million years to develop. And it's going down so fast, the world is going to be out of oil before we know it. This country will be depleted in 25 to 30 years. The only na one nation left on Earth that will have any reserve of oil at the present rate of consumption, and that's Saudi Arabia, 30 years from now. Iran runs out totally and completely at, in 25 years. That's why the Shah, and I met him years ago skiing at Sun Valley, and we've been good friends, and the Shah is a very blunt man. And he's been trying to get OPEC prices up. He thinks we're giving it away with a 400% increase. With a 400% increase. He said it should have been more. He said, why should I give away this precious fuel in my ground at $11.51 a barrel? And don't forget, we used to get it for two fifty one. Eleven fifty one when it's worth $100 or $200 a barrel. A few years from now, in a pharmaceutical or a petrochemical industry that will create employment for my citizens. Why should I give it away to America to waste and squander it the way you are wasting it now? Take a look at how we waste and squander fuel. Watch the next time a snow falls. 
and see how fast it melts on some houses. All that heat is going right up through the roof. We're heating the great outdoors, and we're cooling it all summer. You walk around a supermarket, and what do you see? The first thing I see in the middle of the winter is all these freezers all open. Some of them 24 hours a day, never closed. Pouring out energy to freeze and keep everything in there frozen with the top on and heat being poured out to warm the building. Now, that kind of waste would only be done by this country. No other country I know of would permit that kind of situation. No other country would have rooms on average temperature of 72 or 74 and then cool them to 68 or 69 in the, in the summertime. That doesn't make any sense. And it, it's something we've got to concern ourselves with because, as the president knows, the state legislature in Kansas now has a separate item for energy for this great university. They don't want to get it in with all the other expenses. It's going up so fast. It's become such a high proportion of school budgets across the country. It's a matter of alarm to all educators. All hospitals are worried about it and very concerned about it. And when you have schools closed and a half a million people out of work in factories because we just had a little snap of cold weather in this country. And when my son-in-law had 2,800 people that had to be housed in school buildings because they couldn't get gas into their homes and their homes went cold, you know, we're awfully... We're awfully foolish in this country if we don't take a look at that. And that really, when you consider that currently that corn production, gas consumed by machinery rose from 15 gallons an acre in 45 to 22 gallons an acre in 1970. And currently we use 80 gallons of gasoline equivalent to produce one acre of corn. We realize that as, as fuel prices get more expensive, food prices are going to get a lot more expensive. And when in western Kansas you have to have a decision, they've got water over here and they can pump it over there where they need it. But the energy cost is so high, the water price, it's not a cost-effective thing. Then the lack of water and energy and, and, and energy at these prices, that interrelationship can't be lost upon us. The United States can't continue to be such a glutton, using as much as we do with only a small proportion of the world's population. And I'm not talking about reducing our standard of living or our quality of life. I'm just saying, look at the efficiency of Germany and Sweden. Per capita, they consume less than half the per capita energy consumption in this country, and their standard of living is higher than ours. Now, why do we have to drive around in these gas-guzzling dinosaurs? Why do we have to have such mammoth automobiles? Why do we have to overheat, overcool? Why do we have to do all these things when our quality of life would improve if we reduce that excessive squandering and waste? And this is really why, as we look at the cost of shale, and what you have to do to all those mountains in Colorado, and the production cost estimated at $14 a barrel now, and the huge amount of water it would use. When you look at the spills from offshore drilling and you realize how much deeper we're going and how much farther we're going in that, when you look at the controversy over the north slopes up in Alaska, and you look at the cost of bringing that oil down here, there's one source of energy that's available to this country. And I don't mean solar, and I don't mean geothermal, I don't mean even coal, and Illinois has huge coal reserves, and we want to sell coal. But there's one source of energy available that's bigger than any others, cheaper than any other, environmentally safer, and that's conservation energy. And I don't say energy conservation. I say conservation energy because conservation is a source of energy. This is why, just three weeks ago, I decided we had to do something in this country to mobilize. We're in a war. We're vulnerable. 
We're vulnerable to embargo. We're vulnerable to political pressure from Arab OPEC countries that could change or attempt to change our foreign policy. We could be brought to our knees economically in the next embargo. That's a dangerous condition for a great nation to be in. Something has to happen. So we created what we call the Alliance to Save Energy. It's a national alliance in which we now have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the CIO, AFL, the UAW, the Jacques Cousteau Society, the League of Women Voters, 40 organizations have said they'll join with us to create this alliance. And the co-chairman of it, I'm the chairman, the co-chairman is Hubert Humphrey. Fritz Mondale, vice president, and past president, the former president, Gerald Ford, are the honorary co-chairman of the group. And Dr. Henry Kissinger has become the chairman of the advisory board because he says there's nothing more important that I can undertake to do. The sole purpose, is to convince this country, industry, factories, homes, everything else, transportation, that we have to find ways to conserve energy. We can't have the kind of progress we've had in transportation, and I say progress in quotes, because we used to, on an average, 20 years ago, transport 3.4, if you can squeeze it in, people per automobile. Today it's 1.2. We're reversing trends. We're all driving around alone, it looks like, in these big cars. And the cars are five times as big inside as the as 1.2 people would need inside then. And they're carrying a load of steel around to protect themselves against another load of steel coming at them, all of which is essentially unnecessary if each of them relatively would scale them small, themselves down. Small is beautiful in many respects. And people are beginning to realize it, and that's why it takes six months to get a particular make of a Japanese car, and you can get others just like that because people suddenly are realizing 40 miles per gallon makes sense right here in the pocketbook. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to afford fuel costs, and we all know fuel is selling at the cheapest cost today in world history. We'll never in the lifetime of anyone in this room ever see fuel. Energy is cheap as it is today. So we're going to have to do an awful lot of things. Our objective is to save the equivalent of 16 million barrels per day by 1985. That literally means zero energy growth without impeding economic growth. That literally means 35 quads of energy saving by 1985, and we can begin today. If we make a national commitment in housing, the potential there, if we just simply insulate our homes, is enormous. I've checked with the real estate boards, mortgage companies. What questions do people ask today about housing? Oh, schools. Is there a recreation room? How many bathrooms? Do you have a modern kitchen? Maybe 15th or 20th down the line, what does it cost to heat? and cool this house. How is the insulation in the home? Can I have a builder check to see if it's well insulated? No one ever does that. This coalition, the alliance, is to create a consciousness in people. What I want the American Bankers Association, the uh, home loan bank boards, and the savings and loan associations to do is go out and knock on doors and say, we'll give you a concessional loan, an add-on interest cost of 4 to 4.5% four per year, up to, say, three or $5,000 for you to insulate this house. Because you put a thermostat that will knock the heat down automatically at night, you can get your investment back in two years, 50% return on investment on that. You put weather stripping and storm doors and storm windows in a house and insulation, you can get a 40% return on investment. The president of Sears Roebuck said the other day, you don't even need a carpenter to come in and do any of this. If people with homes would just go up in their attic in a cold day and see how cold it is up there and realize that that thin floor on the attic is just a sieve. It's all going up through there. The heat is coming up. It's being drawn up, and it's leaking. All they'd have to do is lay on the floor 18-inch square boards of insulating material, which would cost 50 or $60 for an average house, and they'd cut their fuel costs 10% and they'd get their money back in three months. That's how simple these things are. But those are the kind of things 
we have to do. Much of our public housing leaks. Many, many buildings today, factories and office buildings, are just sieves for energy that we're wasting and squandering and getting absolutely no good out of. So that I'd say that the ability of this country to face up to this problem and become conservationists in the best sense will do more to create an image abroad that America realizes the nature of this problem and we intend to do something about it. The steel industry can reduce fuel demand 50% by 1995 by the best estimates that experts in that field uh, make. In buildings alone, including housing, the best expertise, the American Institute of Architects estimate that we can save 12 and a half million barrels a day by just insulating existing buildings and requiring that we never build another building in this country, house, factory, or office, that against the national interest wastes and uses fuel that is depleting and that we are running out of. Eric Hurst, uh, an expert in this field, indicated that a vigorous program could reduce energy growth to zero by the year 2000. And all in those intervening years, if we keep compounding our rate of use, the number of nuclear plants we're going to have to have, the amount of offshore drilling, the amount of shale is going to deplete our landscape, is going to endanger our shores and waters, and it's going to endanger mankind. Because you can't tell me that when you build a nuclear plant, you're not somehow taking a step that's more dangerous than just pumping a little oil out of the ground or burning a little coal or doing something like that. We're taking life itself and humanity's future into our hands with the proliferation of nuclear energy with the ease with which plutonium can be drawn out for the making of bombs in developing countries today such as China, India, and every place else. So that if we go that route, it's a route of madness and it makes no sense. And that's why yesterday I introduced a bill into the Senate that for the first time will put the non-proliferators with a whip hand over the nuclear salesmen all over the world. And we intend to pass that bill, and I think President Carter will support it. And I have bipartisan support in the House and the Senate for that philosophy. But we have to take the same sense of, of purpose and have that same sense of purpose on saving energy. We're not making radical or unfair demands upon the American people. We're simply prescribing no growth in energy consumption, but plenty of growth in the economic field. Conservation simply means doing better, not necessarily at all doing without. We have to do something about population growth. We know that. We've done it in this country. South America has to. It's drawing too heavily upon food supplies with a compound 3.5% population growth in some of those countries. All of these things to tie together. And finally, we have to have a much more coherent policy in this country, a coherent policy that places all of our natural resources and the management of those in one area and stops scattering among 40 different departments and agencies of government. And that's why I'm very proud, day before yesterday, to have introduced the and been the Republican, principal Republican sponsor of the president's uh, bill on energy and the reorganization of the federal government to create a Department of Energy and Natural Resources so that we can hold one department responsible, one place responsible for what we're doing to ourselves in the future. And we don't have so much diffused responsibility that no one really knows where the buck stops. The buck is going to stop in that one department. And I have every confidence that we're going to enact that into law. America is the richest, most abundant nation on earth. It is the breadbasket of the world, but it's also the energy guzzler of the world. We've got to keep one. We've got to stop doing the other. I think if we forge an, a sensible national energy policy with conservation as our principal guideline, I think we can lead the way toward a world free of the fear of hunger and create a far better image for America than we have in the world today. Thank you very much.
Senator, thank you very much. We have about five minutes uh, if there be questions from the audience. Be the questions. Yes. Yes. I'll uh, rephrase the question. A GAO, Government Accounting Office, report in 76 referred to perhaps too many uh, unilateral uh, food aid organizations. Do you subscribe to the contents of that report? Yes, we have a, a, in this country such an incoherent food policy, so many fights and squabbles among various agencies and departments, agriculture going one way, treasury going another, state going another, that I, as the ranking member of the Senate, uh, the Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs, uh, did initiate a total overall review of our participation in the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, uh, FAO. Uh, the report did clearly say we have a, an incoherent policy in this regard. I recommended reform of our policy mechanism so that Treasury, State, Agricultural Department, and so forth, in the executive branch, pulled themselves together and had a more coherent uh, policy. And I was delighted that the feelings that I had were confirmed by the Controller General of the United States in saying that we must do this in order to be better, provide better leadership to the rest of the world so it can have a more coherent policy at the United Nations level. We'll plan to adjourn at 20 after so that those students who have a class at 11.30 can make those classes. Uh, be there other questions? Yes. Yes. question is there a would you like for me to repeat or would you like to <laughs> essentially I think you're questioning my premise that uh, that really Soviet Union uh, not blessed on balance with all of the nature's assets that we have shouldn't be charged have their system charged with the lack of ability to produce food my authority for saying that is simply uh, uh, Mr. Mikoyan uh, who, when I asked, uh, and Mr. McCoyan Sr. was, as you know, president of the Presidium for many, many years and survived and is still alive and well, so far as I know, in Moscow. When I asked the question when I was over there, why Khrushchev fell? What was his principal failing? McCoyan replied to me, Khrushchev had the naive feeling that you de it could exhort people to produce, and that's all you need. What he didn't understand is the subtleties of, and I quote his exact words, the subtleties of, shall we call them, socialistic incentives. What he meant was that pounding the table at the United Nations didn't do Russia much good, and having these collective firms with no incentive for a person to work hard or not work with no increased incentives for them, with all leveled income to them, they needed something different. And Khrushchev was not sophisticated enough in his understanding of man and human nature to realize this. Until such time, this is why Poland has kept 85% of their farms in private hands. 
because even though they're communists, they realize these collective farms with everyone giving according to their ability to give and never taking any more than they need, that's just a lot of hogwash when you get right down to what makes people tick. And they're no different than we are. Polish under the communists act quite different than they do when they're in this country and the Polish are over here. And it's the system. It's not just... I'm not I'm taking away the fact that drought will affect them and affect us and cut production. But it's just simply that through the years, year in and year out, our yields are so great that the teams they want to have come over are agricultural teams to tell them how to produce more with the given resources they have. Be there another question? Yes. The government at present is spending $3 million a day for the production of the B-1 bomber. Is there not a better way the government could be spending this money for things like energy, uh, reducing energy consumption and food production? Is there not some better way the money for the B-1 bomber could be spent, for example, in energy or food production? I've been so concerned about our defense expenditures as to whether they are going into the right thing, and we have, as you know, for our strategic defense, a triad a system of defense, which we base it on bombers that are overhead right now, uh, armed with nuclear bombs. They're up there 24 hours a day. And they're using fuel, <laughs> huge, enormous amounts of it. And you have the silos with the ICBMs, and you've got the, you've got the submarines with uh, 31 of them under the water actively right now, uh, each with 16 nuclear bombs uh, capable of just obliterating the Soviet Union. What is the role of the bomber in the future? and obviously the Soviet Union, and we have looked at it differently. Uh, we're questioning it, and that's why I voted to defer the decision on the B-1 until a new president came in. Then let's have his recommendation and take a whole new look at it. But simultaneously, I have asked the foreign relations to hold hearings, and we're in the midst of them, to have the best expert testimony we can as to how the B-1 fits into that. And I'm sure we're going to come to a much better decision once we have the benefit of a whole reassessment as to where the B-1 fits in. Now, I was convinced the SST and the ABM were the two biggest boondoggles I'd ever seen. And I fought mightily to defeat them. And we did defeat them. And never should we be more grateful than the fact that we're not building this monstrosity, the ABM, which would stimulate nuclear production and, and missile production over there, because you only need one more to penetrate all the defenses you have. Well, that we're not building the SST today, which is a flying Edsel, as I called it on the floor of the Senate. Economically, it made no sense at all. The British and the French want to make them and sell them at half their cost and subsidize us to come back and forth at the rates they do and still charge 120% of first class fare. Let them do it. That's their symbol of prestige. But it doesn't make any sense for us to do it. We're looking at the same thing in the B-1. Does this thing make sense? Does it make sense? I don't know the answer to that yet, and that's why we're holding the hearings. It's why we're asking the president and a new secretary of defense, Harold Brown, to take a good hard look at this and see whether it's cost effective. When we have a vote on the floor and we have to say A or nay, I'll make my mind up then. But I've got an open mind right now and a, qu a quizzical mind. I pretty much made my mind up on the breeder reactor. I think this is the most dangerous thing we we're undertaking, and I think we're spending far too much money on it, and I'm concerned. I'm almost at the point where I think we ought to stop its development. Uh, so dangerous do I think the breeder reactor will be for future society once we develop it. But the B-1 is still an open question. I want to try to keep an open mind on it. The senator has a few moments before a luncheon commitment, so those who have not been able to get their question answered may be able to come down and ask questions Gentleman directly. Right here, has been trying to get. Oh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, we'll take one more. The, we we certainly uh, excuse those who uh, who need to get to their 11:30 classes. Uh, yes, sir. I tell you what, class hour has come. Why don't you and I? Have you got a chance to just come up and talk to me up here? Okay, fine, thanks. Thank you very much indeed. I appreciate the chance to be with you. You've been listening to an address by and a question and answer period with Senator Charles Percy, Republican of Illinois, speaking in the series of Landon Lectures in McCain Auditorium on the campus of Kansas State University in Manhattan. 
Senator Percy's address in connection with a two-day conference taking place on the campus dealing with the politics of world food production and supply. The technical supervision for the broadcast by Del Staub and Ron Jones. This is Ralph Titus, and this is the K-State Radio Network.